Today, we're going to learn how to create the intros to Peter McKinnon's episodes in DaVinci Resolve. So you can see here, we're in the media tab of DaVinci Resolve. I've already imported the media, but of course you can right click and choose import media to bring in the media yourself. So let's go ahead and right click, create a new timeline using that clip. We'll go ahead and give it a name just so we're keeping track of everything. And then we can choose create. Now we'll go over into the edit tab. One thing I'm going to do here before we proceed is that we don't need this audio at the bottom. So I'll right click, choose link clips. Then I'll go ahead and select just the bottom and hit backspace. And now it's gone and we just have our footage. Now, in order for this effect to work, what we have to do is duplicate the footage that we have on the timeline. So what I'm going to do right now is we'll go ahead and select that footage. I'll hold down the Alt key or Option on a Mac, and then I'll drag up, and you'll notice that it creates a second instance of the same footage. And in this case, one will function as the background, and the other one will be our obstruction in the foreground. You'll see what I mean as we continue through the process. So this is our color tab. And what you'll see here is our footage. And what we're going to do is use that pillar as a way to obstruct anything behind it, as you saw in the example at the beginning. So the way that we do that is to create a window around that particular object. I'll come down to the bottom here and we'll choose the window option. And let's choose the pen tool option. This way we can make our own shape. So I'll start at the top. And then what I'll do is click and go ahead and bring it down. I'm using the middle scroll wheel to bring the footage in closer so I can see it. Now, in order to make shapes like this, what you do is click and drag. And that way you can make curves other than just clicking and you're making straight lines. Now, we don't necessarily need to go around the entire pillar because we're not going to be using that portion of the footage. So I'll just finish off the rest of this by clicking on the outside and just bring it all the way around so that way I'm back where we started. Now what you'll notice is if I go ahead and scrub through, it doesn't stick to the footage. The shape remains the same, but obviously the footage changes. So what we have to do now is go into the tracker. Now you wanna make sure that in the tracker you're choosing the window option. And let's go ahead and track forward. You may have noticed watching that footage go through is that it's no longer lined up with the outside of the pillar. And I'll scroll back and forth and you can see where it follows it at first, but then you can see where the pillar peaks outside of the window. So what we have to do in this case is change it from clip to frame. And the reason that we're doing this is because now we'll make our adjustments and it will place a keyframe every time that we make an adjustment. So I'll scroll ahead a little bit here and then I'll go ahead and move the window. And you can notice down on the time bar there, there's a dot and that indicates that the keyframe has been put there. So let's go ahead and scroll forward a little bit. And then you can see how it's peeking out. We'll move the window over a little bit. And the great thing about this is in between keyframes, it's interpolating the footage. So it's not going to jump from one location to the other. It's going to make a smooth transition between the two. So we'll continue to move the footage along, keep adjusting the window, and the system will make the interpolation between each of the keyframes. So now that we have it completed, you can see that the window sticks right to the edge of the pillar now that we made those adjustments. Now that window isolates the selection that we made. In order for this to make sense, what we need to do is right click, choose add alpha output. And now I'll go ahead and drag a line from the blue output of our node all the way to that new blue alpha output that we created. Now to see what this did, let's go ahead and go back to our edit timeline. And then I'll choose the visibility on the bottom row. And now you'll notice that our top footage only contains the selection that we made within the window. Now the black is just the alpha. As you saw, if we activate the bottom one, we can see right through this one into the bottom because whichever layer is on top 
takes precedence over the ones beneath it. And because it's the same footage, it's not obvious where we made our selection when we have both of the tracks activated. Now we're going to transition over into the Fusion tab. So I'm going to hit the spacebar and enter. And let's go ahead and type tracker and we're going to use camera tracker, which is our 3D camera tracker. So let's go ahead and hit add and that will add it into our flow. So beneath the two windows of our footage is basically a timeline of the footage. It shows all the frames in between and the red line is the playhead. What we'll do is drag that all the way to the beginning because we want to track from the beginning to the end. Before we do anything, let's go ahead and add it in the line between the media in and media out. So we'll hold down shift and we'll drag it in between and it will connect it in between both. Once we do that, we can come up to the top and hit auto track. You'll notice in the window now it's added little track points of things that it's using to try to determine 3D space within the footage. We don't need that node position where it is. What I'll do is grab the part where it connects to that node, disconnect it. I'll move it up a little bit, disconnect from where it connects to the media out, connect the line from the media in to the camera tracker and a line from the media in to the media out. And you'll see by the white dots on those two nodes where media in is on the left and media out is on the right. The next step in our process is to go over to the camera tracker and then choose solve. Now, without getting too technical, what a solve does is basically informs you of the quality of the track that you have. And the smaller the number, the better. It's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to get a perfect track. The goal here is to get anything below one. Now that our solve has completed, you can see where the solve was actually over one. It's 1.6662. So now we have to clean this up a little bit in order to have a better result. Our next step in the process is to go over into the track filtering portion of the camera tracker. So what we can do is make the adjustment on the minimum track length. And if you look at the selected tracks, now it's chosen 27 that don't fit into those parameters. So it's not really a great point to use as reference. So we'll choose the button to select tracks satisfying filters and then delete to get rid of them. We can continue to make adjustments like this. For example, we can use maximum track error and we can make adjustments there. And you'll notice in the selected tracks area, it starts to pick up more. If you look at the footage, it's the yellow dots that are the ones that are actually selected. But in this case, we're going to put a ground plane right there on the ground. And those aren't the points that we want to select. So come down to maximum solve error. We'll drag that to the left and you'll start to see that the selected tracks start to rise again. Referencing our footage, those look good. We'll select track satisfying filters, choose delete, and then get rid of those. Now we'll come back up to our solve and see if we've done any better. And now we have a solve under one. It's 0.5879. And this is a great track and the one we're going to use. We'll come over to the export part of the camera tracker Right now you see where it says aligned, but we don't want that. We'll go ahead and choose unaligned. Under orientation, it says XC plane, and that's what we're going to focus on now. So I'll take my mouse, I'll hold down the left button and drag it around the points that I want to use as the floor, basically as the ground plane. Those look pretty good to me. So we'll come over to orientation. I'll choose set from selection, and it sets the numbers under the X, Y, and Z rotation. At the top, we'll choose export. And you'll see both on the inspector on the right and down in the node tree where it's added five more nodes. So I'll connect everything up here from the media in to what was just created. And then from there over to media out. Now, if I make the merge ID visible by choosing the left dot on that node, it will make it visible in the left hand window. And you can see the ground plane on the floor there in the magenta color. And even though it's not oriented in a way where the lines on the actual ground and the lines on the plane match up, it does appear that it's sitting right on the floor there. What I want to do is change it from the camera view to perspective, and you can see what's going on. We have the footage right at the end there, the ground plane, you can see it right there in the magenta color, and then our camera on the left hand side. Now, of course, our final step is to go ahead and add some text in there. So you see, I already have it selected, but let's choose space and enter, type in text, and we'll choose the text 3D option. I'm going to drag it all the way over to the left-hand side here and connect it right into our ground plane. Now, in order to see this, let's come over to the Merge 3D node, choose the right dot for the right window, 
and then change our view from perspective to the camera 3D mode that we had initially on the left-hand side. And we can do that by right-clicking in that area. I'll make this a little bit larger so that we can see it. The first thing we're going to do in reference to the text is use the text that he uses in his episode intros. The name of the font is Foxing. Right here I have the Foxing demo, and that means we're just limited to no caps and no numbers. We'll work around it in this example, but I recommend that you get this font too. I'll come up to the box here, and then I'll go ahead and type in episode one. Now we can't see this footage, and that's because it's laying flat across the ground. So let's navigate to the portion of the text node where we can actually change the rotation. I'll change the X axis to 90 degrees. And it's still looking a little bit small, so I'll go ahead and adjust the size. So now we're starting to see our scene start to come together. Now the remainder of this tutorial is basically trying to get this text into place. So we'll use the translation of the X, Y, and Z axis and move those around until we have our font exactly where we want it in our footage. And remember, we want part of our font to overlap the pillar there so it acts as our obstruction. The one last thing I'm going to do is change the Y axis to 45 degrees. So this way it tilts a little bit to the back. This way it lines up with the actual ground floor and actually places it more in the scene other than facing straight forward towards the camera. The one last thing we have to do to pull this all together is uncheck the hide button on the top layer that will bring our obstruction back. And as I scroll through the timeline, between the positioning of the text and the obstruction that we created, it really looks like it's placed within that scene. Now we've created something very similar to what Peter McKinnon has in his videos. So if you guys really like this one, go ahead and give this video a like. If you want to help support the channel, please share this around so that other people can learn this technique. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel. Check me out on Instagram. Check me out over on Twitter. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Talk to you soon.